Welcome to Tuesdays with Karen and Martha. Tonight we're going to talk about materials and resources and creating the right environment for your child to learn and meet their education with success. That's right. I want to introduce Martha to you today. She, can you introduce yourself, Martha? I am Martha Watts and I am an educator. I work along with Karen. Karen is also an educator or a former educator. And together we have written the book, Homeschooling in Times of COVID-19. And we are here on Tuesdays to share with you the value of this book. And I want to say to you though, even if Karen and I didn't discuss that, is that parents in international spaces are buying our book. So we had more than 70 people in India purchase our book. So we want you to know, those of you listening right here, that people are finding the book useful. It's only $2.99 on Amazon, the e-version, and $7.99 for the hard copy. So please go ahead and grab a copy. You know how things are becoming a lot more. Um, we have a lot of you know, uncertainty going on. And you may have to homeschool your child. And even if you're not homeschooling, just the idea that your child is at home and you're going to monitor in their education, you will get a lot of tips from this book, Homeschooling in the Time of COVID-19, written by Karen Porter and myself, Martha Watts. So tonight we're going to talk to you about two more chapters in the book, and we're going to come to you every Tuesday, as we promised, to give you a heads up as to how you can better monitor your child's education at home. And if you email me, Karen White Porter at gmail.com or Martha at Martha J. Watts at yahoo.com, you can get a um, handout about how to create a wonderful environmental space for your child. So we will send you the PDF of that. Mm -hmm. um, some some nights we give out free books too. So, well, you never know. You, you, maybe you're the first person to put the fifth email I open. Um, maybe the third email I open, you'll get a hard copy. Send me your email, and um, if you email and talk about, you know, you saw us on Facebook or on YouTube, wherever you saw us. We, you will get um, one person actually is gonna get a hard copy of I'm um, from you. So send your email, say that you want your book, your copy of homeschooling in time of COVID-19 and you will get that from me. Just one give over time. And um, as you can see from the poster behind me, I'm really big on emotions. I've written a lot of books to help children cope with their feelings. And um, tonight, what we're going to talk about has a lot to do with the effective filter that children have when they learn. When their effective filter is low, that means if a child's less nervous and less um, anxious, they are going to be more apt to receive information, to process it, and to be more involved and interested in their material. So how can we do that? How can we create a little space in our home that makes your, their child or your child feel comfortable and secure and safe so that they can learn well? What are the some tips that you think would be a good environment or the, or that it's in the book? Um, chapter five. So tonight we're gonna be chapter five, materials and final details. Yeah, so we have a we have a learning space checklist, mm -hmm. and you know an, an open, cheerful area, and so a window view is nice, so they don't feel cooped up, mm -hmm. and not too hot or sunny or cold. You want to have um, a large enough space and chairs the right size. So if a child feels like their little feet are dangling there the whole time, they might not feel as comfortable. If, unless if they have a chair their own size to do work. So that's really helpful. Um, so a footstool for young children to reduce strain on their short legs helps. Also, um, this was, Martha and I were talking earlier 
I think both of us grew up in a home with tons of books all over the place. Yeah. Uh -huh. And to me, it's just like part of being at home is being around books. So mm -hmm. Right now on the, my bookshelf right here, I have books that my grandmother read when she was 13 years old. I mean, they really mean something to me. And if you can create that same kind of love of learning and reading with your child, having the books around and displayed on bookshelves really will create a learner that really wants to learn. Definitely. And I know it's a technology age and a lot of people believe, well, we have um, e-libraries, we have e-all of those, and why do we need books? Well, it's not the same. Um, if you are on an e-library, your, your chances of being distracted is just so much higher. I could be reading a book where I have to read it on a Kindle and I can just touch one more but button and I am somewhere else. I'm on Facebook or I'm on, on YouTube or I'm somewhere else. So we are not against e, e um, books, but it's not the same as having the tactile, the book that a child can touch. And so books, the environment for books is just, it's so important. So for me, growing up, books were everywhere. I mean, even when a particular religion, they come by and they would have their books that my grandma would have to give them 10 cents or five cents. But she kept it and she read and I, I, I mean, you just, I saw her reading all the time and I just knew um, just books. You go to the library and, and that's why I always, one of the reasons why I do not like to watch, to watch the movie version, books that have been um, made into movies, I'd rather just, if it's a book that I enjoy, I'd rather never watch the movie because I have been so, I'm so used to creating my own images when I read. When that author writes and creates those pictures, I want to have been the one to create them. And so I do not even want to see what a director has to do. So what I'm, the reason I'm, I'm saying this is to say that we have to create that environment. So yes, you want that child to have that table where it's comfortable, that chair where it's comfortable, but you also want to have something in that area that makes it look schooly, that makes it look like a learning environment. You have books, you have other things that will evoke that thought process of um, learning. Okay. Yeah, so having the books, just having them around. And then um, also that tactile sense of having a book there makes a difference because children are more in the world in a more tactile space. So when they can see the colors and hold the book and sit down and feel the weight of the book in their hands, it makes a difference. And just as you have books in your hand, you also want to put scissors in a child's hand. You want to put glue and paint and wire and clay and all kinds of things like that. So having little hand manipulative items for your child to manipulate with their little fingers can make them more cognitively flexible and more cognitively, cognitively involved. So those, in the book we have, we list things that you might want to have um, and to do science experiments and yarn and ping pong balls and balloons and things that you can use. Mm -hmm. And so um, once you get all of these things, um, then you have to decide what curriculum to pick. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people come to me and says, well, what should I choose? And uh, that's, I can maybe give my opinion, but I don't think I've ever had a parent who agrees with everything I say, because those children are not my children. Yeah. And uh, the one thing they all agree on is that you need to learn your child. Mm -hmm. You need to learn what their learning style is. So if you learn what your child's interests are, and we talked about the interest inventory earlier, um, you can decide on what books to choose. So being your own critic of curriculum, 
you can be, have a better idea and a be, draw forth a better curriculum for your child's independent needs. So what are some things that we should be looking at at our books that we pick for a child? So I like to tell parents, find your child's interests. What, what, what is the child interested in? If your child is interested in dolphins, then why would you want to give them books about snakes? And if they're interested in snakes, why would you want to give them about dolphins? So the first thing you always want to do is think of your child's interests. Next thing I want you to do is also to think of the child's educational level. You do not want your books to be too low level in complexity. You do not want them to be too high in complexity either. And it depends on what kind of books we're talking about. If it's just reading books, books for reading, then you want to make sure that the book is just, just a little above their, their reading level because you want them to be able to learn new words and get that gradual, you know, upward movement rather than you just say, oh, well, you're supposed to be you're 10 years old. I'm going to pick up with that for 10 year olds. Well, your 10 year old child might be reading on a 15 year old level as well as that 10 year old child might be reading on a third grade level as well. So you want to make sure that you are aware of your child's educational level. And by that we mean what kind of words can they read already? Um, we, we have um, examples of, well, there are actually out there, um, just a little gauge that tells you about Lexile level. If a child is on that particular Lexile, these are the words that they probably would know. And of course we have also the Dolce list where you have all of the words that a child should know on a particular grade level or at a particular age. So if you're not too sure where your child might be, you can do one of two things. You can ask a certified teacher to help you figure that out. Or you can just Google the Dolce list and just have your child read those words. And if you notice they're getting 10, say we have 20, you pick 20 words. And then you want to see how many did they get right. If your child can get at least 15 of those words correct, without making any errors, then you know that's like comfortable. If they're making, it's like five, only five words correct, you know that's too difficult. If they're somewhere like around 12, you know that's instructional. In other words, I can leave them with that book with the confidence that they can build on it. So there are lots of ways that you can figure out what level your child is on. Of course, that's the not professional or not the, you know, the, the you know, if I were to do that as a person who is, certified in reading, I would actually get the right set of words and you know I would know exactly what to do to tell that to you. But you can just use a basic Dolch list and figure it out. Let your child read them. And then you can tell what words would be too difficult. And at the back of most books would say Lexile level. And so if you read if you looked at the words and it says okay your child is comfortable with those you can decide what Lexile level you, your child is on and you can pick that book. Lexiles are not always the right way to tell you um, a lot of things. None of those things are 100% accurate, but it's just one of the ways of finding out your child's educational level. But again, the first thing I want to recommend is interest. What is your child interested in? And with that um, interest, you can do the spiral thematic learning. So let's say mm -hmm. your child is interested in Indians. Now you have the choice of doing Thanksgiving and dressing up in pilgrim outfits and, and you know, with out of, made out of paper, construction paper and little Indian garb, or you can really get become a woke homeschooler and you can do the research and find out what the native people in this North America were doing before the white man came. And you can study that and, and then go to an archeological dig, read books, um, have, do some hands-on learning, but then, and then write stories about what you see and ask questions about what you think about what you see. And so it becomes a spiral. So you're doing, if, once, once you do thematic learning, you can do, draw pictures, that can be art. You can have a physical education thing where you're do, playing it a game, playing high life like the Indians would play back in the day. So it's the, the 
possibilities are endless when you're homeschooling and the choices you make about what your curriculum is, what is the knowledge you want to learn, I think are very important. And you can educate your child in a more modern, progressive way um, that match your belief system. And a lot of parents are looking at things in very innovative ways now and thinking about what is the, the knowledge that we are teaching children? Why are we teaching them what we're teaching them? And I think we the homeschooling um, groups are perhaps very revolutionary. I'm not saying that all of them are because some people are gonna to wanna to go back to public school and be part of the traditional societal norms. But I think the norms are up for grabs right now. So perhaps um, we, your children are the future. So we need Definitely. to take that very seriously. So I want to piggyback on one thing that you said. You said to parents that you can pick things or curriculum first based on your belief system. And one of the things that we, what makes it easy is that we are focusing on skills rather than just so for example, you can read a book on, you know, something that you maybe alligators. And I could read one on elephants. And we can learn the same concept as far as the skills are concerned, even if we're using different subjects, different topics. And so we want parents to know that the key here is, is my child learning that standard of, of mastering that skill or that standard that is supposed to learn on that particular grade level doesn't have to be the same book at all. It's just, am I asking the same questions? Can they have that? Do they still have that opportunity to develop their critical thinking skills, their problem solving skills, their research skills? It doesn't matter what I use. I could use what I believe in or what I want them to learn, but they're still, they will still be able to go to take a test. So if you want to send your child to take that test on the district level after, they should be able to pass because you have taught them those exact standards that the state is requiring, saying that every child should be able to, you know, yes. conduct the research. Every child should be able to answer a question that's critical thinking or that requires analysis, that requires comparison, contrast, that requires cause and effect, that requires... So as long as you're teaching those concepts, you shouldn't worry about whether you decided to do it with only things dealing with the ocean or things dealing with land. Of course, we want knowledge because we do have one of the big, big research is coming out right now, or studies, I should say, is talking about the knowledge gap. So we still want to make sure that although we are choosing our own curriculum, we want to make sure that we are exposing that child to knowledge. So if, for example, if you decide, oh, well, I don't believe in space and I'm not going to let my child read anything about space, then you're refraining your child or, or keeping your child back from learning a whole wide variety of, of, you know, of knowledge base that may be on test. Or maybe- You know what's so interesting though? I've, I've had um, a lot of experience with different homeschoolers and there's this curriculum called the Abeka Homeschool Curriculum. Mm -hmm. And they also, they do um, work with, you know, creationism and Bible verses on every page of every thing. But the worksheets they have maintain the skill level and standards. So there are people that go through that whole Rebecca curriculum, graduate from high school, and they go on and become nurses and doctors because biology that they need to become a practicing nurse is very factual and matter of fact, what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. Now, they, I don't, I've never met one that went on to study astrophysics. Uh, <laughs> because have that, there's I, a lot of science that, you know, they mm -hmm. just can't, or, or, you know, with the evolution and biology and DNA and things like that. <laughs> and, um, you know, carbon tracing and, not going to be able to do some of it because of their belief system. Mm -hmm. um, but 
you know, in the, in the same token, I've seen people that are doing the unschooling thing. And sometimes that will work and sometimes it fails miserably. But when it does work is when they are reading. Exactly. So that's what we're that's what we're exactly. Exactly. Lots exactly. of books and you teach them how to read and then they become like these voracious gobblers up of Not book it. after book after book mm -hmm. and you can't get them to get out of the chair and stop reading. Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and that is that, that is very important because one of the reasons I said to I said to parents and one of the reasons I like the idea of homeschool is that Homeschooling parents are more, well, the ones that I have encountered. I can't say that for every one of them, but they're more open to having kids read books from almost any setting compared to when we look at our book list on the, on the public school. Um, you know, we usually have a set of books that we expect the kids to have read. I'll give you an example. I went to a workshop and one of the, the, the presenters asked, what books do you read when you were in a particular grade level? And the books that the, 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 the people who are my age group or a little younger, the, all the books that they mentioned that they read at that grade level, I cannot, <laughs> I didn't, I was not able to identify with any of them. So, um, well, a few, when it came to the point, things like Hardy Boys and Nancy Drews, of course, these are, um, British, you know, authors, and then you had the in it back into more American. So I had, um, I realized that even where we grow up, they just gave us one set of books. So I prefer, so just as I wasn't able to associate it with any of the books that they mentioned, they were not able to associate with any of the books that I mentioned either. So we have here that polarizing because, you know, the British system, they had me read books from British authors and then the American system had it you know but then now as homeschooling parents we have the ability to cross that we can go across i can let my child read a book from anywhere you know it doesn't have to be from a particular setting and so that's one of the advantages of having of controlling or or being able to choose you know your child's um you know to to how would i say i don't want to say control but to take charge of your to child's guide, to guide, maybe. To guide. because you can decide i want you to read a book that was written by someone in india or that was written by someone in the caribbean or written by someone you know let's see you know that kind of exposure and values you know i in my household values like compassion and kindness and forgiveness and multiculturalism or like high on the list just things I try to instill in my daughter and I look at her now and really, to be honest with you, I'm glad she gets good grades in school. But if I had to pick between having a child that's a kind, loving, compassionate adult and or a person who has a brilliant test scores and is mean, <laughs> I would pick the compassionate child or oh. adult. Because those things are skills that really pay off in life mm -hmm. and make your life better. So we need to stop looking at education as just a skill session where you have to maintain certain skills and start looking at civic duties. And I think they are in public schools. They really are because they have the children required to do um, community service. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that really adds to their maturity. I've, I, I've noticed that. Mm. So um, we are almost coming to the end. I, are we coming to the end of the time? How long have we been on now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I really hope that you can um, take a look at our book and email us if you have questions. And we will be posting this on our Facebook pages and um, Messenger and, and um, Instagram if we can. Mm -hmm. And uh, what else do we so have? So I just, want to just recap, just say to them, you know, if you want to do homeschooling and you feel, you know, you need some help, you can email us, we'll help you. You know, we can guide you again with your letter of intent. We can um, talk to you about 
your certified teacher evaluation. We can talk to you about how to go about, you know, getting connected with other homeschool parents, um, how to, you know, choose your curriculum, create your space for your child. We are, we are here, we are offering our help to actually guide you if you feel um, stranded. And I, we always want to remind you that homeschooling is not the same as e-learning. Homeschooling is not the same as online learning. So these are three different things. E-learning is right now at school, you are with your child's school, you just happen to be at home while your child's teacher is in school with some other kids and they are on the same time as school. That is your e-learning. Your online learning is when you go ahead and you do your um, state's online public school, but you can do at any time that you please other than except that you have a teacher assigned to you or you can but homeschooling is not is neither of those two you can have an online curriculum but you the parent is the one who is in charge of the child's learning you just use the state guidance as far as your standards are concerned as far as what they should know on what grade level but you as the parent choose you you get to choose the child's everything that child reads, that child studies, you get to make that choice. All you have to do is to assure the state that your child has met standards for each grade level. And there's a way to prove that. So you can email us, Karen White at Gmail, at Gmail, Karen. Karen at White Porter at gmail.com. And Martha J. Watts at yahoo.com. You can email any one of us and we will be sure to return your whatever information you need. And you can check us out on Facebook, um, Literacy with Dr. Watt, you can find me there. And Karen White Potter, author, the author on Facebook. And um, you can ask us any question and we will answer you. And look for us again next Tuesday when we come to share with you another chapter in our book homeschooling in time of COVID-19, and you can get a copy for $2.99 on Amazon, or a hard copy, $7.99, or you can send an email and you might be the lucky person to receive your hard copy in the mail. Okay, good night, everybody. Yeah, thank you and bye-bye.